I'm joined now by Hassel Eklund, the Falkenberg FF manager, um, who has had an incredible end to the season, which we will shortly uh, discuss. Hassa, thank you very much for joining us on the Nordic Football Podcast. How are you today? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Thank you very much. Good, good to hear from you. And uh, yeah, I mean, obviously there's only really one place to start, uh, which is the last day of the season um, and Falkenberg's incredible last day survival. Uh, I suppose this is the only really real place we can begin, so please uh, sum it all up for us in, in your own words. Um, the day, the occasion, what it means to the fans, everything. Just sum up the the situation for us and you know that last day of the season there, escaping on the final day. Yeah, it's true. It was uh, really the, the last escape. Uh, it was a strange game because... Uh uh, we were met. Uh, we met uh, RFC, who was in the bottom of the table. But if they have scored against us and uh, we'll be taking the three points, uh, we will be relegated. So we know that it was a difficult game for us. We wanted to go forward to win the game because then we know we had a chance to stay up without the playoff games. Uh, so we had three options when we were playing the game, and it was. Uh, it was a tight game until the end, then it's opened up and uh, we were afraid a little bit uh, that Sundsvall will score against Oeko because then we, we, uh, they will go uh, past us and we have to play to play the playoff games. So it was a difficult game to, uh, to coach. But uh, in the last uh, moment, in extra time, we scored uh, the final goal and uh, we, we had a lot of feelings inside us was coming out and we could stay in Allsvenskan without playoff, uh, without any <laughs> any nerves in a <laughs> two games uh, playoff. So it was amazing. Yeah, it really was incredible, obviously, watching it. And, you know, in, in general, the whole day was an amazing end to the season at the top of the table as well and the, and the bottom of the table. We talked about the, um, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned there the Gifsundsvall game, for example, and... The, um, even in the Malmo, you know, no shopping get so, uh, the no shopping your garden game, all the games just seemed to be a bit crazy on that last day. Everything was happening every every minute. We were we were following it. I mean, you mentioned that it was quite hard to coach. What was the the challenge in that sense? Were you you know, there's always we always talk about in football on the last day of the season when every game is at the same time. You know, people checking their radio or checking like Twitter or checking you know like the news to see if the goals are going in. What is it like as a manager coaching on the last day of a season like that, where you, you know results can change your approach as well and, and tactics? Yeah, like you said, it's uh, you have uh, you play thirty rounds and it will uh, uh, sum up all in the end of the the last game. Uh, I think we had a pretty good uh, shape uh, and uh, good form to to take that on that challenge, the playoff games. I think we uh, we had some. Uh, uh, good energy in the team, so I was not so afraid of the playoff team uh, to play that kind of games. But yeah. I was a little bit afraid that RFC would score, and uh, so I, I wanted to go forward to, to win the game. Uh, but you couldn't let RFC win our game, so it was a little bit difficult to have to control the defense, but uh, but still go forward to, to score the final goal. Yeah, of course. I mean, <clears throat> do you have did you have someone checking the results, like you know maybe someone in your team or? Was it like, did you know the scores as, as, as things were happening? Or? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, we had uh, full control over the other games. Uh, we had uh, play, uh, some members of the team uh, watching the games and also uh, give uh, our uh, information the, our, to our team, to me. Mm. Uh, it was a little bit difficult because uh, Sundsvall could win the game. Yeah. Uh, and But uh, it was 1-1 one, one a long time, so it's... Uh, it was also difficult for us if our had scored uh, uh, three zero pretty early. We had maybe a challenge ourselves a little bit different, but now we had two games to, to think about. It was our own and Sundsvall Oiko. So, so but we have full uh, full information during the whole game. Yeah. Now let's just uh, play that clip at the last minute, just for those who don't remember. It was a ninety second minute uh, and Seema Peter's yeah. goal to keep the team in the league. Let's just have a little listen to it. Yeah, 
I mean, Hassel, what was the emotions when in the 92nd minute um, and Seema Peter scored that goal? I mean, people are going crazy in the stadium and, you know, well, for you as the manager, you've been there for sort of five years now. <clears throat> well, since 2015, you've been there in two different spells, which we'll talk about in a minute. But what was it like, that the emotions at that moment in time? Yeah, it was incredible. It was the best moment for me as a coach. Uh, you pray to God uh, something like this will happen. And it happened in the final final minute. And uh, Before that, we have a, a good chance. We were counter-attack in transition. We played four against one. And we managed uh, to shoot uh, outside the goal. And AFC was uh, shooting a long goal kick up. And uh, get a shot against our goalkeeper. And he saved it. And they make a long throw to uh, counter attack again. So it was back and forth, and uh, the feeling was upside down and inside out. Uh, it was a remarkable uh, last two minutes for me to remember as a coach. But when you had uh, the good result, it's it's just fantastic. And the, the crowd and the people were so so happy because we we didn't get uh, the odds uh, we had the odds against us the whole season and everybody think that we will be relegated so it was amazing yeah i can imagine and <clears throat> the thing is you actually uh, this wasn't even the only um, last minute escape was it because you the second last game of the season you also had a last uh, or an 89th minute winner against kalmar uh, obviously your former yes. your former team away from home which which really set things up i mean you know if you actually, if you really look at the table and how the season went um, for those who might not be aware, of course, with, with two games left of the Ospenskan season, Falkenberg were, were bottom of the table, um, four points away from safety, and with the worst goal difference in the table and the most goals conceded in the league. I mean, be honest, with four points and two games to go, did you really think there was a chance to survive, or in your mind were you thinking, well, you know, we're down, or, you know, that, that, an incredible escape, you know, with two games left, what, 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 were in, what was in your mind really going into that Kalmar game as well? Yeah, we have been talking about this. We started the training in January 7th and we've been talking the whole year about uh, we will have some problems, mm. but uh, we will fight. We are a fighting team. Uh, we don't have the best players, but we need to be a very good team all the time. We talked about... Uh, uh, we had OIK, uh third game from the end, that we maybe need some point to take in the last two games because... Uh, Kalman also, we felt that it's two teams we can win against. Yeah. It's, it's more in our level. Of course, it's a big club and it's maybe hard to get some points, but it was at our home ground. Mm. And, and uh, we prepared for for two weeks for that game because uh, the, the national team was playing. So we had uh, two weeks training preparation. Uh, but <laughs> after eight minutes in that game, our goalkeeper was uh, sent off, a uh, red card directly, and it uh, was a game we lost uh, pretty big, 5-1. But there was one important thing from that game was that Insima Peter scored a goal. And he got a good feeling into uh, the Kalma game, who was next, and he scored uh, three goals the last three games. It was very important for us. Yeah, you're right, and you know, it was an incredible escape, to be honest, with uh, two wins there to get you out of it. I mean, would you say, you just mentioned there, it was the highlight of your managerial career so far. Um, yeah. Would, would you you'd definitely say that it was the best moment? I mean, you, you obviously you were promoted um, last season uh, from the Super Etten. That was the best moment, though, for you in, in your managerial career so far, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I, I was in Falkenberg before, and then... Uh... Uh, the first time I was in Falkenberg was 2013, and we uh, went up to Alfenskan. It was uh, it was a job during the whole year. Mm. We were uh, underdogs the whole year, and uh, we managed to get to Alfenskan. That was also a good moment for for me. But it was more work during the whole season. This was just a, a big, big moment. Yeah. Uh, he scored a fantastic goal, really strike a goal, and. Uh, suddenly, <laughs> all the things come over, the pressure, everything, and it was uh, amazing. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. And congratulations, of course, from us on the podcast. It was really an unbelievable escape, to be honest. And you survived for another year in Falkenberg in, in Ostfenskan, so looking forward to 2020. Yeah. I mean, for those who, who may not know too much about you, obviously a bit of background now. Um, obviously, Hans Eklund is a 50-year-old coach, I believe, with um, a high-level playing career. Uh, he played for teams including Osters, uh, IF, Servette in uh, Switzerland, Helsingborg and Viborg as well, and also a spell in China. 
Uh, he won seven caps for, or you won seven caps for uh, Sweden's national team before retiring in 2004 and moving into management. Um, in your managerial career, of course, you've uh, coached Viborg, uh, Falkenberg and Kalmar, and you are now in your second spell, as we just mentioned there, at Falkenberg, having rejoined the club in 2015. Um, and just tell us a bit about your playing career and obviously playing for playing for Sweden. I mean, what was uh, the highlights of your career, you know, and your, your personal achievements? I mean, one interesting thing which we'll talk about shortly is, of course, you were one of the uh, Svenskans top scorers in the Skitterliga. You won the Skitterliga back in the 90s. So you've had a you know successful playing career. How have you? What have you learned that, from your career that took you into management? And you know, just tell us a little bit about your your playing career in general and your highlights. Uh, yeah, I was uh, playing like you said, uh, top football for, for a long time. And uh, when I started to play top football, I was 17 years old. And uh, uh, when I started to, to play, I was uh, sure that I will someday would be a manager. So I prepared. Uh, pretty early to get uh, the manager job. So when I had a good manager during my career, I uh, collected the papers and uh, notes and uh, uh, lyrics from from big coaches and and um, write write down everything that he said. Uh, so so I was prepared to be a coach uh, when the, the, the playing career was over. So I, I started pretty good. So. Uh, the debut, I was 17 in the highest level in Sweden, and I made uh, uh, national caps for, for Sweden when I was 18, so it was pretty early. Uh, play under 21 in Sweden, but then I get injured in my knees, I have to make a surgery uh, twice, and um, my career stopped a little bit, but I think still I had a good career. Uh, like you said, I won the top scorer list in, in 92 in Sweden. And I get to play abroad a little bit, play some national games. So I didn't reach the, the big uh, moments outside uh, as I wished, but I still think I had a, a good career as a football player. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> of course you've moved into man management after that, you know, as, as, as you mentioned. And, um, you worked as a, an assistant manager uh, to Henrik Larsson, I believe, at, at Land Squad of Boys. Um, what yes. was it like working with him, uh, and what did you make of his situation this year at Helsingborg? Obviously, um, you must be you must know him fairly well. Um, what did yeah. you make of that situation, and what was it like working with him as a coach? Because he was linked with some clubs in England recently, uh, so it'd be yeah. interesting to get some insight of his him as a coach and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's uh, true, like you said. I've been working with him, and uh, I think he's a he's a good coach, he's a good person, and it's, it was very sad when the Fans uh, attacked him, uh, had actually attacked him twice in Helsingborg because he was trying his best. Uh, and uh, and uh, when we was working in Inlands Krona, he was pretty new in the management business, but he learned very well. He had a good career and he's good handling with the players. He's, he knows everything from his own career. He takes care of the players in a good way and he can teach them a lot. And uh, the players really listened to him. So it's... Uh, He's a good person, and uh, yeah, the fans was not so satisfied with his job. He, I think he, he made some good good points for Helsingborg. Uh, they started to win when he started again after the summer break when he, he get a chance. But to be honest, the team was not so good. The players was not so good in Helsingborg, so it's it's hard to get scoring points uh, game after game and uh, suddenly you make uh, one or two losses and then the, the fans was not so happy and threatened him so it's not mm. good yeah I mean I remember that season um, 2016 season when Helsingborg went down obviously and that was quite quite a bad situation so for him to return was always uh, seemed quite strange in some ways um, you've been yeah. at Helsingborg of course so you know what was the mood of the club like there I mean in, in, what did you make of that whole situation is it something that you know, is un, you know, unexpected, or was it kind of? Did you think it was a, a bad decision to go back, for example? I think the decision to take Henrik uh, was a little bit strange because, uh, like we said, now he had some troubles when they were relegated, mm. uh, and they took him back. Uh, uh, that that was a lot of courage in that decision, uh, but for Henrik it was a difficult start. Uh, the fans was against him from the beginning, mm. I think. Uh, and Helsingborg, uh, to be honest, they have problems with the financial, they have problems uh, with the management. They have uh, This year have four coaches in one year, so it's hard to make a good uh, 
good results uh, during that uh, during that time. Uh, now, the last five years, they have financial problems. Yeah, of course, and I mean, you know, ultimately, if you look at the table, you weren't too far away from them in the end. Uh, just five points behind them, actually, uh, as the season ended. I mean, you you were obviously promoted with them as well last season. Um, so you learned a lot from Henrik in your in your career coaching with him at Landskrona. Tell us about your challenges as Falkenberg manager yourself. You know, you've moved into management now. You've been there for sort of four years now, heading into your fifth season, uh, fifth year there. Um, how t- just how hard was it to survive in Svenskan this season? You know, give us an insight into the challenges. You know, how difficult it was. You mentioned you you don't have the best players. You know, how difficult was yeah. it really to coach that team and and ultimately survive? Yeah, the the challenges, like you said, is that they, the top teams have all the good players. Uh, the individual individual is very good, and uh, for us who are on the bottom of the table, the first seven team, we didn't take any points from the first seven teams away or at home. Mm. We we didn't have possibilities to take any points, so, so it was difficult for us. But we knew we could take points from from the other teams, and we have to make. Uh, make ourselves uh, from the best. We have to be a very, very good team, organized, working hard, because we don't uh, have the best players. Uh, our salary is uh, far, far away from the average salary in the in the top. Uh, they're making uh, a lot of money in the big clubs, and of course, they also have the, the best players. So it's it's difficult and. We are also a team that play on the real grass, and yeah. we have a lot of astroturf uh, uh, teams in Alsenska. And it was also difficult for us to change from grass to artificial grass, so it's uh, made uh, made it di- almost uh, impossible sometimes to, to take points because it's it's a different type of game. Is that a big problem? Do you think in Alsenska the the difference? Because I think. I think only six or seven teams in the league have grass pitches. Is that a big problem? Do you think? Yeah, and, and uh, this year was ten teams actually. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, of course, we, if you play the, the bottom teams, we have a chance. But the top teams, or uh, they play so fast, you, you can't catch them. Yeah. Uh, or players have problems to catch them because they, they play hard and uh, direct passes, and we. Uh, we, we don't have time to organize our defending against the top teams in us, uh, artificial grass, so it's a uh, uh, big problem for us. But How I think uh, during the winter we, we can train in uh, artificial, so mm. it's okay anyway. Well, what, what would you like to see? Would you like to see changes made? Would you like to see more grass pitches? Or you know, what's the solution to that in your opinion? And because there's a big, always, there's always a big debate about that. You know, grass pitches against artificial yeah. surfaces. What, what's your take on that? And yeah. Yeah, I think uh, all uh, all of the teams want to play in good uh, good games in, in uh, good stadiums. Uh, I understand that the, the weather sometimes make it difficult for us to have good good uh, plans to, to play at. Yeah. But uh, I think we can make. I think uh, if we have uh, good grass and we have uh, heat under the grass, I think we can play up in the north uh, with uh, really games not artificial. Yeah. I mean, tell us about your so own. My opinion is that we. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it is a difficult one. There's always that debate. Um, tell us about your own man- managerial philosophy, because you know the style of play you like to play. Um, if we look at the statistics from from Falkenberg for the last couple of seasons, um, you kind of tend yeah. to favour a lower lower possession based uh, sort of style. Um, you had a 47% possession average this season. Uh, sorry, 42% this season and 47% last season in the Super Etten. Um, in 2018, you scored the most goals in the Super Etten. Uh, you had the most most crosses into the box, but you also conceded a lot of shots um, on target. And you know, defensively, uh, 424 shots faced. Um, and this season, you had the highest number of interceptions in the whole whole league, um, but, but a low pass rate, the lowest uh, number of passes per 90 minutes. Tell us about your own general managerial philosophy, um, the style you like to play, and obviously how difficult it is when you have, like you say, maybe less lesser players. You know. Changing your style to suit that. Tell us about your philosophy. Yeah, I think the management uh, start with uh, the philosophy that we want to get forward, to score goals, and try to create the games. You can you can do it in two ways. Uh, first, you wait for the opponent to make a mistake, or you can get forward to create the mistake. And I want to get forward, play offensive, and create the mistake in uh, the opponent's defending. 
that's the first philosophy. And uh, as I've been a striker myself, I want to score goals. And uh, I like possession, uh, but I think uh, you have to understand that the possession is only if you can score goals. Yeah. To, to move the defenders, get the spaces you want, and overload uh, two against one, three against two, and create mistake uh, in the opponent's defending. That's, that's number one. And uh, when you defend, I, I want to steal the ball as fast as possible to, to be able to attack. If you can make high pressure, if you can steal the ball as soon as possible, it's, uh, it's uh, an advantage for us, I think. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, we conceded a lot of goals. And I think when you work, uh, work as a coach, you don't have... Uh, the best player you need to have a team who is organized mm. and uh, what we tried to do this year was to organize the team in a good way and the uh, expected goals uh, we had, I think we had good numbers in expected goals uh, but our individual uh, defending was not so good so we was letting 15 or 16 goals in that we didn't want to do mm. So we, we were pretty organized, but the, as an individual, when we defended, it was not so good. Yeah. And we had to learn from that. Yeah, it's a very good point you make there. I'm, I'm interested to talk to you about expected goals because that was going to be the next point we make. You know, we've been monitoring, we've been following obviously the league all season, and we said a lot of times on the podcast that, you know, Falkenberg, your expected goals are actually in the top 10 in the league. Um, yes. And even your expected goals against were in the top 10 in the league, 10th. So you're tenth for both, yeah. which is obviously comfortably clear of relegation. The, the good individuals who can score goals. We make the the passes that we come in a good uh, good positions to score goals, but we don't have the skill to, to score. Uh, and the same in the what we defend. Yeah. We put the, the opponent in uh, good spaces for us in good areas, but they are too skillful, or we make mistakes, so they can score anyway. Yeah. Uh, so that, uh, we we try to use that as a as a learning uh, tool for us to expect the goals. Tell us about the budget there, because obviously, I mean, how, how, how difficult is it to uh, attract uh, top players to the club, and, and what is the approach to scouting and, and recruitment and that kind of thing? How do you how do you go about it? Obviously now, you're in the winter period, um, you'll be looking to maybe recruit players. How do you go about scouting and recruitment as a, as a team like Falkenberg? Yeah, as a team like Falkenberg, we have to wait for the right players to come to us. Uh, we always... Uh, Try to scout uh, players in Sweden or in Scandinavia uh, because we want to have a good team. We take only English-spoken players so, we, so they can fit into our team. Uh, but it, we have to be honest to say that the, the top players, they're waiting first for the big teams in Sweden. And if we don't get any contract with the big teams, then they come to Falkenberg. And <laughs> then we, we are ready to, to catch them. Uh, you have to understand that... Uh, I think the average salary in Sweden is uh, about 90,000 Swedish crowns per month and uh, our average salary is uh, 25,000 so we, it makes it a little bit difficult for us to attract uh, the best players uh, but a lot of players want to come to us because they can develop and they can make money in the, in the next step yeah. and we play attractive football so, so I think a lot of players still want to come to us and a lot of young players and a lot of players who have been injured uh, waiting for a new chance they come to Falkenberg to repair their career and start over again yeah do you, do you get a lot of um, involvement yourself in, in, in the sort of scouting and the transfers or do you, do you do you kind of just take recommendations or you know yourself um, or with the sporting director for example that kind of thing how does it how does it work on a practical level because you mentioned you, you scout a lot of Scandinavia um, do you look at other areas? You know, you have international players like, for example, Peter and Seema from Nigeria. Um, how does it work from that point of view? Yeah, we have a manager who is uh, responsible for the scouting, and uh, he he decides what to take in, of course. But uh, we are three coaches in the team, and we look uh, when we have the time. We look uh, against uh, against uh, new players who will come to us. Uh, we look against. Uh, the top top league in Sweden and Superettan and the first division, uh, but to be honest, it's not so so good scouting. Uh, we don't have the resources to do pretty well, so mm. it, it will be a lot of time and connection with the agents sure. and uh, players and 
clubs who take contact with us. So we're not so active as we maybe should be. We we can develop that. Of course. Sure, sure. Absolutely. And I mean, yeah, looking ahead, I mean, just last last couple of questions now. You've um, I wanted to ask you one thing about your your own career as a striker and and, and looking at the league in general. Like, what do you think? You know. Um, you were obviously a great forward at Osters winning the Skitter League. What do you think? Who do you think was the best striker in Osvenskan this season? And uh, if you could sign any any player for your own team, any striker, who would you who do you who would you model that? Who do you look at and think, yeah, that you know that player reminds me a bit of me, maybe or you know you who do you really rate in this league and then maybe wider, you know, around Europe maybe? Yeah, the, if you talk about the striker, I think. Uh it's a little bit difficult. I think there are good uh, strikers in Sweden, but uh, I like uh, Boya Torai in mm. uh, Djurgården. He is a fast uh, striker who makes the de- defenders work in a good way. And uh, also Rosenberg is a good striker who yeah. works with the defenders in the, in the other way. Uh, but they are two top strikers. Uh, our strikers, uh, we, we play with three strikers, yeah. but we, we had some problems this year. They were only scoring four goals. so. Uh, we have to <laughs> develop them a little bit for the next season, but I think uh, the tempo was a big difference from Superettan to Allsvenskan and it took time for us to, to learn the new tempo. Yeah. Uh, I think the, we had a good team, but one player I was to put a little bit forward, the other one is uh, uh, Jon Björkengren, a central midfielder who was also brought into the under-21 national team in Sweden. Yeah. Uh, it's our own product, it's working really hard and, uh, and uh, yeah, typical Falkenberg, he fights a lot to run and, and uh, try to steal the ball, make interception and and also uh, uh, score goals when he had a chance. So it's a it's, uh, good player this year was Jan Björking, absolutely. Yeah, he had a good season and, and, and I think you had that problems with Marcus Matisse as well, wasn't it, when he was injured, which was a, a bit of a... A problem for yeah. for Falkenberg. Um, I wanted to ask you just quickly on that point about the Osvenskan against the Super Essen because we we've had a lot of debates on on the podcast about that. Um, how big is the gap? Do you think? And because if you look, for example, at last season, the teams that that were relegated, uh, Dalkurd, Trelleborg, and I think it was I'm trying to remember, Dal, uh, I'm trying to remember now. But anyway, Dalkurd and, and Trelleborg were two of them. And they really struggled to yeah. um, come back up this season. They've had problems. Oh, Bromma Poikina, of course, who have gone back down again. Um, yeah, how big yeah. is the gap between, um, you know, Osvenskan and Superettan, in your opinion? In yeah, it's, uh, it's a big, yeah, it's a big gap. It's, it's uh, like I said, we didn't take any points from the top seven teams, mm. uh, so it's a big difference from the top to the to the bottom. And uh, AFC and Falkenberg and Helsingborg, uh, almost the whole season was struggling in, in the bottom of the table. Mm. Uh, then Helsingborg was taking in a few players that had a little bit a little better financial than we have. So they were moved uh, in the end of the season. They're moving up a little bit in the middle. Uh, but uh, OFC and uh, Falcon were still in the bottom. So it's it's very difficult. It is, uh, and uh, if we make one year up in the in the highest level, the next year will be tough because the best player will, will disappear. Uh, yeah. So uh, there, there, there are a lot of big teams with good history who play in Super Etan, uh, but I think that the financial is so much different uh, in the, in Alsenskan compared to Super Etan. You have much more money and and uh, yeah, it's it's a big gap. Yeah, absolutely yeah. with the financial. I can imagine. And a final question, really looking looking forward, <clears throat> you've you've survived. You are an Alsenskan club again for 2020 um, you've been there for obviously five years um, what is the next challenge for you on, on, for the team itself obviously looking ahead to the to the winter will you be active in the market or what, what will you look to develop <clears throat> and also maybe in, in your own personal ambitions what are you looking to do you, would you maybe look to manage abroad at some point in your career would you be looking to maybe move up and progress or are you very happy at Falkenberg and kind of um, keen to build the team maybe yeah, first, uh, I want to establish uh, Falkenberg in, in the middle of the table. Uh, that's our priority for 2020. Mm. We want to avoid the, the bottom table fight and get up a little bit. Uh, uh, so that's the priority. Uh, and uh, for my own thing, I want to get abroad as the coach. I want to. I've been in Denmark for coaching, but I want to. Uh, learn more from other countries and coaches and teams so if i have the chance to get abroad somewhere i will definitely take the chance and try to learn more 
uh, if you don't have the ambition to, to get better as a coach, you will stop being good. So absolutely, I want to get to growth. Fantastic stuff. <clears throat> Hans Eklen, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, really enjoyed speaking with you. It's a fascinating insight. And as I say, from all of us, congratulations on, on surviving. It was a really incredible end to the season. So thanks for joining us and uh, speak to you soon. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.